Man's progenitor was a creature, an animal, walking erect, but with simple consciousness merely. He was, as are today the animals, incapable of sin and equally incapable of shame, at least in the human sense. He had no knowledge or feeling of good and evil. He fell or rose into self-consciousness. His eyes were opened. He knew that he was naked. He acquired a sense of sin, became a sinner, and learned to do certain things in order to encompass certain ends. That is, he learned to labour. In still other words, the animal cannot stand outside itself and look at itself as any self-conscious creature can. Thank you. What he's doing there is the old wine and new bottles. He's telling the story of Genesis by making it a direct description of how human beings became conscious. Moving from animal conscious, in which they, you cannot sin, you cannot have shame, because you don't know yourself in any separable sense from what's going on. You're involved in everything you do, like the, the dog that doesn't know, it knows it's hungry, but it doesn't know that it knows it's hungry, so it can't respond in any way. It doesn't have an awareness of itself to feel shame in or sin about any of its actions. It reacts to the environment rather than that it actually forms from a unified center a mode of action. Once it steps into that consciousness, then sin can step in because you can get this thing of doing the wrong thing, whether the wrong thing is the inefficient thing or the thing that gets itself into trouble or the thing that gets it into, into trouble with the herd. So it's a social constraints can be put upon it and then you get things like shame and sin entering into the situation. <coughs> so the old wine in new bottles which, it, which is being pur purveyed here is that this is the story of Genesis told from the point of view of an evolutionary statement of human beings moving from animals that just react to their environment into human beings who respond to the environment and then have a level of choice in that reaction. So it's then because we have a level of choice involved in it that we can sin and we can be ashamed of what we've done because we are the progenitors of it. We are the ones who have actually given ourselves to that. We have self-awareness. Does that make sense? So he's retelling the, the religious story there and describing it purely and simply um, in that way. I remember talking with a, with a boy, he's now a boy who does our computers actually, when, when we were at school and he said to me, you don't actually believe in, in Adam and Eve, do you, sir? And I said, how do you mean? He said, well, the idea that, that there was the first man and the first woman. And I said, well, you mean the word for the first ones? <laughs> and he said, no, they were apes. And I said, well, yeah, but... So when did they become men? And he said, well, they slowly changed. I said, but there must have been a first one. <laughs> and I said, what about the first one that realizes that it's an ape? <laughs> and we, we talked about this really quite well. We were talking about it over lunch. And I mean, um, it wasn't a scripture class or anything like that. So we didn't... Neither of us had to, had to get, get a point across in that sense. But... People actually, I think I can say this, but yeah, but there must have been a time when the first one <laughs> said, wow, look, um, what hairy hands I've got, you know, or if I, you know, pick the stone up and shape it a little bit more, it'll, it'll cut more meat. This sort of level, you know, and, well, look at me, I'm doing this, and they've got big clumsy ones over there, you know. <laughs> you've got this interact. There must have been a first level when we started to do that. And when you write about that symbolically, then in Genesis, then you talk about this coming, you know, the first man and the first woman. They knew that it wasn't complete because when they had children, the children went off and, and got wives. So they weren't, they, weren't, they weren't talking about it as a, a creational thing. God only made this little family. They're talking about the first ones who would call themselves human beings. In other words, the first conscious ones. And they're, they're placing it historically around four or 5,000 years ago, which is when human beings started to record in literature, uh, in writing, self-conscious experiences. Now we've been producing artifacts for about 12, 15,000 years. 
but you, you could so to say to yourself, yes, they're moving towards self-consciousness, but we're talking about an axe head, we're talking about a spear handle, we're talking about things which have been decorated. When the, the, the anthropologists would say, if it's just an axe head, then it's just a utilitarian thing, but when they start to put marks on them, which are unpractical, they don't actually do anything, they've obviously made it their own. Because, you know, mine's got a little picture of a Venus on it. And mine's got, oh, mine's got a football team on one, I've got Chelsea written on mine. <laughs> so they're personalising these things, then you, you can see that there's an individual involvement with this thing. Then you've got the sense of self-consciousness in whether they were apes, whatever they were, they were like us because they were conscious of themselves. And that would get more and more refined. As more and more of them in the tribe got it, then you could have discussion and argument, um, and then you've got intentionality becoming more and more refined to the great sophistical, sophisticated levels that we've got now. We can watch Carnation Street, or we can watch America's Got Talent, or whatever. The choice is endless. When you think about the amount of interaction, though, uh, human interaction to actually get these things, get, get a TV station going, get all those sort of information out, the vast l level of complexity that there is just to watch a simple TV program is stunning, phenomenal. And that that should come out of creatures that could gather bananas and just about run on their hind legs for small periods of time. It, it, it's absolutely amazing. There is something pushing through, going for more and more sophistication, more and more complexity. And you have to see that in the way that the religious figures like um, Gautama the Buddha, the Buddha um, Muhammad, Jesus. So he's linking in from these people who have got vast religions formed around them with characters like Socrates, um, Plotinus, Roger Bacon, Dante. He's pulling them into situations and describing, saying that these point people are all talking about the same experience. Um, some people have been elevated to the level of gods because of the way they described it by other people around them. Others have been kept as individuals, as <laughs> philosophers, etc. But he's saying it's the same experience. Um, and I think in that sense we have to, to give Book a pretty good pat on the back because he was one of the first to actually say this. And the first to name names and say, look, I think this guy is. And in many senses I think he's putting them forward as let's argue about this one, you know, because the language is, is obscure and the information is obscure, but it's worth talking about. And I think most of the ones are the ones that, that we would have discussed at some time with, with Eugene, which would have come up in, in certainly St. John of the Cross, that's John Yepes, the, um, the nerd, number 14. Um, Francis Bacon's a weird one for us to do because of course, the book is a Baconite, so he believes that Francis Bacon wrote Shakespeare's sonnet, so he's in there rooting for this guy, Francis Bacon, who was a, a brilliant man, um, member of the government, etc., and quite a character, but um, I have ne never been convinced that he wrote Shakespeare's plays at all, and it's unnecessary to even say it. But Jakob Bohm is in there, um, spelled differently, number yes, 17. Um, Spinoza, Eugene used to talk a lot about Spinoza, Swedenberg. Uh, Blake. So, Balzac, new to me. I, I've not read any Balzac at all, so that's new to me. Whitman, is certainly his poetry is very moving, um, and that does certainly have this wonderful interaction with, with nature. It's, uh, it's, it's very powerful stuff, but I wouldn't have considered him in that light until the way that book describes him, and of course he knew the man personally, had treated him as a doctor, so he knew him well. Um, so that interaction... Is, is worth is worth looking at in the book. So that's just the sort of that's the great thrust of his of his argument. Now there are a few points now which I'd like to go through. It's quarter to nine.